Welcome to Culture Wire. I'm your host, Meg Schiffler. Here we are at the San Francisco Arts Commission Gallery, where Chain Reaction 11 is on view. On this episode of Culture Wire, we'll take a closer look at this exhibition, which showcases the work of 30 Bay Area artists in three Arts Commission Gallery locations. We'll also find out more about the history of the gallery as it celebrates its 40th anniversary this year. And for all of you lovebirds out there, we'll check out a very different kind of wedding ceremony at San Francisco City Hall. We had one person on this banister that was having some text with a person like way over there on that banister. And for us, that was just about this huge expression of love and adoration. As some of you might know by now, I'm not only the host of Culture Wire, I'm also the curator and director of the San Francisco Arts Commission Gallery. 2010 marks the gallery's 40th anniversary year and we have special exhibitions and events planned all year. I recently had an opportunity to sit down with Director of Cultural Affairs, Louise Cancel, to discuss the history of the gallery from its psychedelic early days to its current internationally focused program. As a former museum director, it should come as no surprise that I have a great affinity for the visual arts. And so it's with considerable pride that we start 2010 by celebrating the 40th anniversary of the San Francisco Arts Commission Gallery. Joining me in this uh, celebration is the current director of the gallery, Meg Schiffler. The 40th anniversary reception that we had last week was so exciting seeing not only yourself, but so many of the earlier directors that were here, and it's such a great history. Can you tell me a little bit about Elio Benvenuto, who was the first director and, uh, of the gallery, and, and why he founded it? Well, the Arts Commission Gallery was founded in 1970, like you said, by Elio Benvenuto, who at the time was the San Francisco Art Commission's visual arts director. Now, before the gallery came around, that meant that Elio organized an annual arts event uh, that was celebrated by the entire city, artists would arrive for the jurying process. They would hold their pieces of art in their hands, walk into the building, and a jury would say, you're in or you're out. And um, believe it or not, artists subjected themselves to that every year to get into the festival, which just said there weren't enough opportunities for local artists to show their work. So the gallery was founded, and when it was founded by Elio, he named it Capricorn Asunder, which was very reflective of the 1970s, sort of just post-psychedelia. And from the very beginning, the gallery very quickly, I think, reflected all of the kind of diverse interests of the, of the visual arts artists of San Francisco, including some pretty strong you know, political views. Certainly a municipal gallery would reflect um, the nature of the city, and this is a city full of activists. This um, is a community that's never been afraid to voice their opinions about issues not only locally, um, but global issues. So the gallery has reflected that throughout the years. They had shows um, in reaction to Jesse Helms and the NEA and censorship at that time. They had exhibitions about um, gender and sexuality and um, identity. And of course, in 1989, the city suffered a, a major earthquake, uh, which impacted you know, the many, many different uh, facilities. Um, the gallery was able to continue operating at Grove Street uh, uh, for a couple of years, and then it was forced to be closed, correct? It took the city a few years to figure out which buildings that they owned would be able to remain active and which would need to be either renovated or closed. And unfortunately, in 1994, they decided to close the building that the Arts Commission occupied, and that sent the gallery into, um, you know, the gallery and the whole agency into a search for a new home. And that's how the gallery ended up in the Veterans Building across the street from City Hall on Van Ness. And so this really begins the tra that tradition that, that now exists of uh, the Arts Commission Gallery having multiple locations. When we had to move out of the Arts Commission Gallery's original home on Grove Street, I think it was very savvy of Rupert Jenkins and the 
uh, folks at the Arts Commission at the time not to completely give up that building. Now we operate a window installation program out of that original site. You are the current director and you have uh, established a wonderful uh, legacy of, of exhibitions. Let's, let's talk about some of the highlights. Well, I arrived in 2005 and inherited the program from Rupert Jenkins, who was an incredibly um, active and I would say very aggressive curator. Um, so I had a wonderful sort of tone set to take over when I began programming. It was important for me uh, to reflect Gavin Newsom and his administration. And when I came in, Gavin Newsom was speaking of San Francisco as an international you know, metropolis. And I think that the gallery program previously had focused a lot on uh, local artists and local issues. Although Rupert did uh, break out of that occasionally, I think that I wanted to bring a greater emphasis on contextualizing our local art production with what's happening around the world, both in contemporary art dialogue and also with issues the artists are concerned about. The very moving um, photography exhibition that you did called After the Revolution which featured photographers from Iran. I organized an exhibition with um, Azala Hedayat, who went to the Art Institute and is a photographer who lives in Tehran. Uh, we organized an exhibition with 10 artists, five photographers from Tehran and five photographers who are of Iranian descent who live in California. It was the first exhibition of its kind in the United States, and I'm incredibly proud that we were able to host such a large exhibition that gave people insight into um, what people of a younger generation in Iran and within the diaspora are thinking about. Last fall, uh, the fundraising event that you pulled together called Passport was just a smash. And I just love, could you talk a little bit about Passport? An individual would buy a passport, which is a little moleskin journal, and take that passport to a specific neighborhood on a specific day and walk around to local businesses. At each of the local business, an artist was there waiting to stamp your passport with a custom artist stamp. And so at the end of the day, everyone who participated had a limited edition passport book with stamps inside um, by 14 local artists. Have you picked the, the next neighborhood? We haven't yet, but we're working on it. We're sort of keeping that under wraps for a short time, and the next one will happen in the fall of 2010. Well, we've got the Chain Reaction 11 in all of our galleries, including uh, the one here at the War Memorial Building, and uh, it's a great tradition, and it's a great way to get introduced to uh, this great legacy of exhibitions uh, that the Art San Francisco Arts Commission Gallery has. Well, thank you. And then Replay, the San Francisco Arts Commission Gallery from 1970 to present, is a collection of over 200 uh, posters, photographs, art objects um, that's also housed, that exhibition is also housed at City Hall, and it was curated by Kelly Lindner. Thank you, Meg, for all your great work. Thank you, Louise. Replay, the San Francisco Arts Commission Gallery from 1970 to present, was curated by Kelly Lindner and has over 200 objects including posters, photographs, works of art, and videos. You can catch Replay, which is free to the public, Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. To launch the Arts Commission Gallery's 40th season, we decided to look back at an exhibition concept that's been a staple for the gallery since it first appeared in 1985. The concept behind the exhibition is similar to a chain letter. For this iteration of Chain Reaction, a group of 10 individuals who played a significant role in the gallery's success over the years each selected an artist to be in the show. Then those artists each selected an artist, and those artists each selected an artist. Ultimately, 30 artists were chosen by their peers to participate in the exhibition. Our 2010 version of Chain Reaction fills all three gallery sites, the main gallery in the Veterans Building, the ground floor of City Hall, and our window installation site at 155 Grove Street. In the next segment, each member of a complete chain reaction of artists tells you about their experience being both a curator and an artist for this special show.
I was one of the artists in the first Chain Reaction show in 1986. I was very excited about that opportunity. The strength of Chain Reaction is it's an in-depth survey of the work that's being done in the Bay Area without a single curatorial voice. The interesting thing about selecting an artist for Chain Reaction is you're selecting an artist, you're not selecting an artwork. It's almost developed on a trust basis that the first 10 select artists trusting that they will deliver. I picked Michael Orsega because I thought his work would be a, a great addition to the, to the show. He would come up with something that would engage people, would be humorous and accessible without being too, uh, without being heavy handed. The core of the video is really about language and that is consistent conceptually with the work that he has done uh, in the past. This is a piece where the language kind of takes a front stage rather than it becoming a kind of um, subverted part of my work. I took the Filipino National Anthem and ran it through Microsoft Word spell check and corrected the Tagalog version and it's actually called Lupang Hinirang and now it's called Loping Honoring and it's sung by Aaron Neff who professionally sings opera. Choosing one artist was a really tough endeavor. I ended up choosing Suzanne Husky. I have always liked the levity in her work and aesthetic levity, but I know that there is a lot of uh, kind of, she's strongly political actually, and I have been able to watch her work out and work on certain projects, and I really enjoyed how she processes. The drawing emerges from a series of photographs that I have been doing for the past year. I've been documenting a lot of people that built their own uh, houses out of recycled materials and they live, they live off the grid and pretty much in a sustainable way. Um, the installation that's here is made um, with recycled textile that I've been collected and collect all the time because um, when I do sculpture most of the time it's uh, textile based and um, recuperated wood that's inside of it. Pretty much since I started sculpting, I, went, I was drawn to natural elements. In a lot of ways, I keep any kind of technology out of my practice. All the patterns of my fabric, by overlapping all those different textiles, I hopefully like, give unicity to each of the trees and I can, there can be narration via the textile itself. I've been in the position of choosing an artist before, but rarely. And um, also, having been chosen by Mike, for me, was so flattering that I had to live up to the selection. <laughs> and um, I chose Amy's work. Amy's work is, um, deals with a lot of the same issues my work deals with. Um, politically, it's probably on the same, um, it's the same foundation. But the way she deals with it, for me, is so perfect. She is, um, she, there's no ego in her work. And there's no, uh, there's no very little emotional presence. It's very, it's very clean and very conceptual and objectless. And I really appreciate those qualities in her work. I was pleasantly surprised. They're lovely, atmospheric, and I can see them in relationship to Suzanne's. Uh, not only that they're nearby, but there's something about uh, these two artworks that are speaking to one another. The opening night for Chain Reaction was very exciting because there were people 
I saw who I had not seen in 15, 20 years, who had been associated with the gallery, every one of whom probably knew at least one person here. So that was also created a chain of those people coming in already connected to one or two people. And then when they're here, they follow uh, the chains that have been established by the choosers, by the artists. People left knowing new people and knowing more about the history of the gallery and its, its legacy, really. Make sure to swing by 155 Grove Street after dark to check out the work created by the chain reaction of Chris Bell, Elaine Buckholtz, and Floor Vaughn. And check out the ground floor of City Hall to catch an all photography component of chain reaction, featuring both fine art photographers and photo essays by photojournalists. And we'll see you at the main gallery inside of the Veterans Building, where you can see the works of artists featured in this episode alongside 15 of their peers. For more information about locations and hours of Chain Reaction, visit sfartscommission.org slash gallery. On the eve of Valentine's Day, local performer and choreographer Erica chong shek took over the rotunda of City Hall for the world premiere of Love Everywhere. Approximately 40 performers filled the balconies and main staircase where they sang and danced and exchanged vows accompanied by a live orchestra. We had the opportunity to meet with Erica and Keegan Marling of Dancers Group to learn more about how this exuberant performance came together. The piece that we created here was called Love Everywhere. It was inspired by the fact that six years ago in this building, our city started issuing marriage licenses to same-sex couples, and we wanted to generate that same kind of joy and love through the performance work that happened in this building at that time. Coincidences, like I had February available to present something, and I knew I wanted to create something around love, so we thought, oh, Valentine's Day. I was approached by an organization called Dancers Group, and Dancers Group has a program that's called On Site, and On Site commissions site-specific work every year, and they asked me to create something. Dancers Group has a pretty long history in the community. We've been here for 30 years, and over the course of time, we've really shifted from a dance studio, presenting organization, service organization, and we've really had a lot of different roles in the dance community, and we really feel that the ability to provide free site-specific work that's actually in the community is going to help people have a new experience of dance, have a new experience of art in their life. I remember being around the city and around this building six years ago and there was such an incredible feeling of, of celebration and joy and love and it wasn't just about tolerance, it was about this really um, wholehearted celebration of, of difference. So that felt very inspiring in terms of trying to create a work that generated that same kind of infectious enthusiasm. I wanted to create something that was so big and so full of love that we just kind of like blast people away with like the love light that shines from the heart. Woo! Ah <laughs> I know exactly who you are. I promise to heal you or to help you heal yourself. I think a big part of the inspiration behind the work was really this building itself. Um, just coming into this space and just sitting with the architecture, I was very excited that this is a public space. The space belongs to everyone.
So one thing that has been really great about Love Everywhere is that I haven't done very much site-specific work. Although my, my company primarily does work in theaters, I'm excited to uh, explore other opportunities to create stuff that isn't necessarily within the theater space. When people arrived for the performance, I felt like people were already having a good time. There was already a feeling of festive celebration before we even began. When we were performing, I was watching the performers and I realized that their ability to be present increased because I felt like the audience was somehow more present. Because the audience was, was open to this new experience, it enabled the performers to perform with that much more transparency and openness. You can find out more about Erica by visiting her website, ericachungshek.org. And for more information about Dancers Group, visit dancersgroup.org. On the next episode of Culture Wire, we'll take you to the 2010 Mayor's Art Awards celebration honoring world-famous rock and roll icon Carlos Santana. We'll also check out a new program that's transforming spare buildings into dramatic works of art. You can send us your arts events listings or tell us what you'd like to see on future shows by emailing us at culturewire at sfgov.org. Thanks for watching us on Culture Wire on SFGTV.